hello guys <coughs> welcome back to my youtube channel today we're going to learn about the importance of this important concept we call it as uh, biostratigraphy with close relationship with by uh, micro fossil now if you see this is actually a picture of um, planktic foraminifera and nano fossils this is actually used for uh, uh, well uh, correlation so that they actually can uh, the application of this is that so to predict the locations of specific target for uh, oil exploration okay so we start from the idea of biostratigraphy here so <coughs> the succession of rocks exposed at the surface of the earth can be arranged into a stratigraphical column uh, with what you actually see actually a form of stratigraphical column with the oldest rocks at the base and the youngest ones at the top so the oldest rocks at the base we call it most of the time in the sedimentary rocks we call it as the basement yeah and then although the absolute ages have been determined from studies of radioactive isotopes it is customary to use the names of stratigraphical units mostly distinguished on the basis of differences in their included fossils. These units are arranged into a number of, of hierarchies relating to rock-based stratigraphy. We call it the specific name is lithostratigraphy. Fossil-based stratigraphy, we call it as biostratigraphy. And time-based stratigraphy, which is we call it as chronostratigraphy. So, what's actually what it looks like? Uh, what's, uh, what how it looks like the, the idea of lithostratigraphy. So here I show you a, a picture of um, lithostratigraphy of offshore Norway. Okay, this is the courtesy the, the this is the courtesy of Norless project in 2012. As you can see there, so there is a correlation. Uh, of uh, sequences of formations there. So little stratigraphical units such as beds, members, and formations are widely used in geological mapping, but will not concern us further here. The biosin is the fundamental biostratigraphical unit and comprises those rock, rocks that are characterized by the occurrence of one or more specific kinds of fossil known as zone fossils so there is a hierarchical framework of terms used for lithostratigraphic units and from largest to the smallest there are supergroup group formation member and bed the basic unit of lithostratigraphic division of rocks is the formation which is a body of material that can be identified by lithostratigraphical by lithological characteristics and by its stratigraphic position and of course, it must be traceable laterally, I mean horizontally, that is, it must be mappable at the surface or in the subsurface. Now, you see, this is what we call a transition. What kind of transition? Trans the transition into unconsolidated sediment. Uh, this actually, what you see is uh, warm tubes. And then the next picture, what you see is uh, unconsolidated, unconsolidated sediment of mud. <laughs> a formation should have some degree of lithological homogeneity, and its defining characteristics may include mineralogical composition, so texture, primary sedimentary substructures, and fossil content in addition to the lithological composition. We need to note that the material does not necessarily have to be lithified or hardened and that all the discussion of terminology and stratigraphic relationships applies equally to unconsolidated sediment. Now you see this is actually a, a picture of a seabed bathymetry of the Eastern English Channel Study Area. So, 
uh, is actually coming from a paper titled Denudation of the Continental Shelf between Britain and France at the Glacial Interglacial. So the author is Claire Mallet et al. And then after that, uh, you see you see this one, there is a Paleo Valley. Yeah. And then the next picture of it is that you will see that inside of it, you know, below that, there's a channel belt complex, there's a sediment waves, yeah. So that you actually can get a big scale of what's actually the idea of unconsolidated sediment look like. And then we are going to move to the idea of formation. Now, a formation is not defined in terms of its age, either by isotopic dating or in terms of biostratigraphy. Information about the fossil content of a mapping unit is useful in the description of a formation, but the detailed taxonomy of the fossils that may define the relative age in biostratigraphic terms does not form part of the de definition of a lithostratigraphic unit. A formation may be an often is a dichronous unit. That is a deposit with same lithological properties that was formed at different times in different places. So this is a picture of a lithostratigraphic column with so many formation here. You see that uh, the famous Talang Akar formation, which is actually located below the Batu Raja formation, which is uh, dominated by carbonate formation. Carbonate, yeah. So, this is actually an outcrop of conglomerate. Why I actually try to show the conglomerate? Uh, I want you guys just to understand the idea of formation again in further details. So, a formation may be divided into smaller units in order to provide more detail of the distribution of lithologies. The term member is used for rock units that have limited lateral extent and are consistently related to a particular formation or rarely more than one formation. An example would be a formation composed mainly of sandstone, but which included beds of conglomerate in some parts of the area of the outcrop. outcrop I mean. Now we learn about a little bit about structural geology. What you see is actually a, an unconfirmity. So James Hutton, the great uh, geologist and also stratigrapher, found this unconfirmity and deduced that the layers above were deposited long after the beds below had been tilted. And then the second picture of it, this is actually what a geologist sees. A geologist interprets the contact between the two units to be an unconformity. Subsequent studies indicate that the strata above are about 50 million years younger than the strata below. Wow, quite a big gap, yeah. Where two or more formations are found associated with each other and share certain characteristics, they are considered to form a group. Groups are commonly bound by unconformities, which can be traced based in white. Unconformities that can be identified as a major deficiency in the stratigraphy over the area of a continent are sometimes considered to be the bounding surfaces of associations of two or more groups known as a supergroup. Now let's talk about about the chronostratigraphy again. Now this is actually the chronostratigraphy of the offshore Norway. Again, this is related to the uh, Norlax project. Okay. Now this is actually a formal chronostratigraphical time unit. Now these formal chronostratigraphical un uh, time units are also important and include in the sending order of importance the age, epoch, period and era. 
For example, we may say cite the Mycenaean age the, of the Miocene epoch of the Neogen period of the Xenozoic era. Rock units laid down during these times are properly referred to as stages, series systems, and erythems. Less formal divisions are also widely used so that we may talk of the lower Neogen rocks laid down during early Neogen times. In the following text, these formal, informal subdivisions are abbreviated as follow lower cap uh, L, middle M, and upper U, and the equivalence for chronostratigraphy early E, middle and A. Now let's talk further about biostratigraphy. Now, biostratigraphy is the grouping <coughs> of strata into units based on their fossil content with the aim of zonation and correlation. As such, biostratigraphy is concerned primarily with the identification of taxa tracing their lateral and vertical extent and dividing the geological column into units defined on their fossil content. Now, one of the examples of, of biostratigraphy is uh, the coccolites. coccolites. Now, remember, coccolites dissolve when uh, seawater acidifies. Now, there is a good article that I found, so I'm going to read this for you. Associate Professor Tu Hassan Kam and colleagues at the Nano Science Center, University of Copenhagen, are the first to have measured how individual coccolites react to water with different degrees of acidity. Coccolites are very small shells of calcium carbonate that encapsulate a number of species of algae. Algae plays an important role in the global carbon oxygen cycle and thus in our e ecosystem. Our seawater has changed because of our emissions of greenhouse gases, and therefore it was interesting for Hasenkamp and his colleagues to investigate how the coccolids react to different types of water. We know that the world's oceans are acidifying due to our emissions of CO2, and that is why it is interesting for us to find out how the coccolids are reacting to it. We have studied algae from both fossils and living coccolids, and it appears that both are protected from dissolution by a very thin layer of organic material that the algae form, even though the seawater is extremely unsaturated relative to the calcite. The protection of the organic material is lost when the pH pH is lower slightly. In fact, it turns out that the shell falls completely apart when we do experiments in water with a pH value that many researchers believe will be found in the world oceans in the year 2100 due to the CO2 levels. Wow, this is horrible. Explain to Hasenka, who is part of the Nanogeoscience Research Group at the Department of Chemistry, University of Copenhagen. Now, the picture that I'm going to see is that, like, here is the coccolite, while this, uh, the other is A, B, C, D, E, is actually the typical uh, coccolites that actually form. Uh, I'm going to tell you what's actually A. A is Archangel Schiela Specilata, B is Kepiro Capsa Oceanica. C is Mikula concava, D is Watsnaurea barnesi, and E is Emiliana Huxley. Now remember, biostratigraphy is the single most potent way we have of telling geologic time. It allows us to figure out which rocks are the same age as which other rocks, and thus allows us to piece together the rocks that assemble a given depositional environment. Without fossils, we could rely, only rely on the loss of superpositioning and cross-cutting relations to work on the reg regional geologic history of a given area. These generally do not offer enough containing observations to go beyond. It's generally a very broad impression of the geologic past of a given area. So the idea is this. So let's say for an oil company, they drill uh, one location, specific target, 
and they found that it's actually uh, contain gas or oil. Now, uh, from the perspective of geology, that uh, the closest, uh, close, closer to the area, there will be another reservoir there. Now, uh, with the with the help of biostratigraphy, then we can actually can trace uh, how far that the oil or gas also migrate to the other reservoir within the same area so that we actually can reduce the risk of getting the empty empty or yeah no oil okay okay now the problem is that here the main problems in biostratigraphy are first not all fossils are equally useful. Correlation based on groups that slowly evolve or whose presence depends on the nature of the substrate, for example, clams, snails, or brachiopods, may not be clear, nearly as precise and accurate as freely swimming groups such as coccolites, foraminifera, and the ammonites. Now this is a picture of foraminifera. You can see that this is a ben, uh, we call this as benthic foraminifera from the Almucala coastal area. Okay. Uh, the second thing about the, the something that actually become the obstacle of using the by stratigraphy is that good fossils can be hard to find. Some sequences yield only a few fossils, and these few relatively poor time constraints may allow several equally valid correlations that dramatically affect how you interpret the paleo environment. Now, remember, every time you hear the word paleo, it is basically ancient, ancient. Paleo environment, basically ancient environment. It is important to understand the limitations of the data so you recognize those cases in which more data are critical. Now we focus now about the idea of microfossil. Now this is actually the picture of diatoms. Okay, microfossils are among the best fossils for biostratigraphical analysis because they can be extremely abundant in rocks, a particular consideration when dealing with the drill cuttings, and they can be ext extracted by relatively simple bulk processing methods. Many groups are geographically widespread and relatively free from fascist control. For example, the plankton, airborne spores, and pollen. Many of the groups evolve rapidly, allowing a high level of subdivision of the rock record and a high level of stratigraphical resolution. It should also be emphasized that spores, pollen, diatoms, and astrocorts are indispensable for the biostratigraphy of terrestrial and lacustrine successions. Now remember, every time you hear the idea of lacustrine, or hear the term, lacustrine basically lake, where macrofossils can be scarce. Okay, detailed biostratigraphical donations using the groups mentioned in, uh, mentioned here have been developed for the entire Phanerozoic. So, I want you guys to take a look of these diatoms. So these diatoms actually can be found easily in the deep sea mud. Uh, the stuff is literally mud made out of fossils. Of course, they are rather small, a few microns or to a few millimeters. But there's lots of life diversity there. Some deep sea uh, sediments are composed mainly of siliceous fossils made of opals such as diatoms and radiolariates. Others are made of carbon, such as foraminifera and coccolithic forests. Still others are made of organic materials, such as spores and pollen grains blown in from plants and land. Or the skeletons of dinoflagellates, a group of algal proteins. Together, these fossiliferous sediments, also known as biogenic sediments, have the delightful name ooze when they 
are still muddy and unlithified. Other sediments are called chalk, limestone, porcelainite, or chert, depending upon how rock-like they have become and whether they are made of calcareous or siliceous fossils. Now, in the deep ocean near the poles, much of the mud on the seafloor is composed of the skeletons of microscopic single-cell algae and animal protists, the diatoms, silicoflagellates, and radiolarians. Diatoms are photosynthetic algae and are particularly abundant in the Opal Ocean of the North Pacific and Southern Ocean. In both places, nutrient-rich waters well up to the surface and fuel, and fuel massive blooms of opal producing, producing organisms during the polar spring and summer. Most of this opal dissolves again as the shells sink toward the ocean floor, but enough suffice to accumulate in deep sea sediments. Now, this photo shows a silico flagellate, the star like fossil. Can you see it? And a variety of diatoms, the button like or elongated cells from the southern ocean. The sample comes from a sediment trap, a big funnel hung in the deep ocean to collect the skeletal remains as they rain toward the seafloor. Now, the next picture you see is that this, uh, in the tropical oceans, the ooze is composed mainly of calcareous fossils like the foraminifera, a group of single-celled animal protists, and the cocolithophorids, calcareous algae. The photo that you see now shows another